Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webcast. Tonight's topic is neurodiversity in social pragmatics at Landmark College. We're excited to be presenting this webcast through College Week Live. I'm Sally Banta, Assistant Director of Social Pragmatics and Services at Landmark College, which is the first college exclusively for students with learning disabilities, including ADHD, autism, dyslexia, and executive functioning issues. We're also joined by best-selling author, John Elder Robs Robeson, who is an advisor to the Landmark College Center for Neurodiversity and one of our current students, Katie Maroney. Remember that you can send us questions at any time during the webcast. We'll leave time at the end to answer your questions. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about social pragmatics here at Landmark. So our director defines social pragmatics as how to say what when. So basically social skills. We offer social skills groups in which we teach explicit social skills instruction and also social activities. We found that in order for students to make friends, they have to know how, and they also have to have the opportunity. The social skills, in the social skills groups, we teach the peers curriculum, peers for young adults, and it's totally optional. Students have to see something in it for themselves before, before they join. Um, we also offer activities, and we design those activities based on what students are interested in, and we try to create, you know, bring students with similar interests together and also create accepting environments and accepting peer groups. We have social tables at lunch and dinner that are always that are staffed by me or our social mentor. We also offer one-to-one -one meetings, open office hours, and early orientation. So please remember that you can submit questions and they will be answered during the last part of the webcast. So now I'd like to turn things over to John. He's the author of several books, including Look Me in the Eye, My Life with Asperger's. He's an advocate for people with autism. And we're proud to have him at Landmark College as a guest lecturer and advisor to our Center for Neurodiversity. In the blog that he writes for Psychology Today, John called Landmark College the best place for neurodivergent people. Welcome, John. Well, thanks for having me and for putting this all together. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how the culture is changing. Um, you said that uh, Landmark is the um, first college for people with um, learning disabilities, uh, autism, ADHD, dyslexia. And it's true, those things are disabilities. And in the case uh, of some of us, they're you know, genuinely life-threatening disabilities. But the other side of that is that those are inborn neurological differences. And they aren't just disabilities. Um, Autism, ADHD, dyslexia are manifestations of brains that work differently. And because they work differently, there are certain things that we can't do as well as other people. But that is offset by the fact that there are things that we can do that other people can't do at all in many cases. Um, and very often, the conversation is one of disability and us being broken. And, and frankly, that's really unfair. Um, as an example, you look at a, um, a kid in grade school, and he's fixated on astronomy. And you think he's disabled because he won't do his schoolwork, he won't do his English, he won't do his math, he won't do his social studies. But when he grows up and he's one of the top astronomers in the world, you don't think that anymore about it. And, and I think it's so often that we neurodivergent people follow those kinds of paths. And, and Landmark's place in the world I think years ago, people would say, 
it's accommodating learning disabilities. But now our thinking is evolving and we are recognizing that these differences are part of a larger thing. And that larger thing is this idea of neurological diversity um, and, and neurodiversity, which is just as essential for the human tribe to thrive and prosper as all other kinds of human diversity. And, and Landmark is a place where people who are different, neurodivergent people, can find a home. And, and I think that just as in centuries past, Catholic parents sent their kids to Catholic college, I hope that we will see for future generations that Landmark is like the Holy Cross or the Notre Dame of schools for neurodivergent people. And, and I think that it absolutely can be. So that's, uh, I think that's the way to think about this. And, um, and Landmark is in that sense, kind of a springboard into the wider world. If you're somebody who didn't fit in, in regular high school, um, and you want to go to college and you want to do the stuff other people can do and you can't do so much of that without college credentials. Landmark is a place that welcomes our kind of people and it gives us the tools so that you can do your bachelor's degree here. You can do two, two years here and then you can go on. And whether you want to go on to a William and Mary, you want, want to go on to an MIT, you want to go on to State University, Landmark is the bridge that makes that possible. And, and if you want to go out in the community and you want to just work in town, I think Landmark gives the credentials that are increasingly essential for that too. So I, I think that that's the evolving image of the college that I have. Great. Well, should we bring current student Katie Maroney into the conversation? Katie, you want to come on over? Thank you, John. Whoa. <laughs> hey. Hey. <clears throat> okay. So I'm Katie Maroney, a current student at Landmark. Uh, this is my second year um, at, uh, at Landmark, but um, I came to Landmark because I had struggled extensively during um, high school and when attempting my year at, first year at under college, uh, I found that they couldn't help me for, um, for how I learned. And um, I took some time off to think and was introduced to Landmark College uh, through my family and I was, um, I was hesitant at first, just like a lot of other landmark students, because I was so used to not, not having that help or feeling like there was nothing I could do, that I was on my last, <laughs> last strike. But, um, but ever since coming here, I've, I've really experienced success and. <laughs> um, and, and found that it is possible. One thing that's significant, I think, about Landmark is that uh, such a large percentage of the faculty and leadership here are neurodivergent. And, and for me, as a kid in a, just a regular public school, um, having teachers that weren't like me looking at me like I was some misfit alien creature was really disturbing. And when my son went to school, you know, a generation after me, he, he experienced the same thing. And the thing that's remarkable about Landmark is everyone's the same. That's what I see coming here. I can go to any other college and I can talk to groups of autistic students or neurodivergent students, um, but we're like, you know, a drop in a big pond. Here, everyone's like us. 
and, and I think that's a really, that's a really cool thing. You know, it's uh, if you talk about the kind of environment you would want to make the transition from um, high school into college, I think what better thing can it be? Especially if it's a part of your identity. And I think if you know if a, if a great part of your identity is Judaism and being a Hebrew scholar, you belong in a, in a Hebrew school. And and if a great part of your identity is discovering neurodiversity neurodiver- and discovering yourself and understanding, you know that we are more than a bunch of disabilities. Like the guidance counselors told us at age five, I think where would you want to be besides? A school that welcomes that. I think I haven't found any other place other than Landmark that I can not only be myself, but many other students kind of learn to not see their disability as a disability. It's something that now many, many other people have in common with them, and it's implemented into the classroom. And uh, I I think, you know, another thing that I hope that we can do. As a tribe, I feel like we have to show the world that, yeah, a bunch of people with autism, ADHD, dyslexia diagnoses, we can really do college work. We can can create things. We can do things. Because so many people talk about the undiagnosed autistic people that are out in the adult world doing great things. But critics say, well, prove it. They're not diagnosed. Well, here, all the people have some kind of diagnosis, and I want to show the world that, yeah, this pool of people with all these so-called disabilities are doing remarkable things. And I think by doing remarkable things, if landmark students can win a claim and they can gain transfer into other universities who are looking to bring in neurodiversity and bring in people like us, I think that that's going to be a really empowering and remarkable thing. And I think that it provides a path forward for everyone who follows you here. And that's a a thing that I really hope uh, we can build. And and I feel like it's us building our thing together, you know, and I just, I think that is a really a remarkable thing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to be, part of neurodiversity, you know, first uh, at William and Mary, where we did the first neurodiversity program in the country. And um, and here, and, and, you know, at, at Drexel and, and Penn and, and all the, and CMU and all the other universities now that uh, have invited me to come and talk about it and at Autism at Work with all the companies. And they want to hire people like us. And, and this is a thing that's like waiting for us to build it now. And I just think it's really cool. So, so John, you're going to be coming back to Landmark frequently this semester. Um, what kind of work do you see or will you be doing with our students on campus? Um, I think that I want to, um, to inspire them to take charge and become radical. You know, we want, uh, we want a neurodiversity student group that, like I say, will go out, kick ass, and take names, you know, and uh, and it will, um, and, and they'll be self motivated and, and empowered. Um, we talked uh, at dinner tonight about how great it would be for some of the existing landmark students to go back to their little brother's high schools and say, hey, I'm a neurodiversity leader in my college now, and how impressed those high schools would be at that. And um, I think what I want to do is inspire students here to take charge of this. This isn't something that teachers or some people somewhere are going to do for us. This is a thing we're going to do for ourselves. And, And I think the thing about Landmark is Landmark is full of neurodivergent staff that can come along on the journey, but this is really about student empowerment, students taking the lead in doing this. And I guess I I sort of come as an outside agitator to bring them that message. That's what I see, so. So Katie, 
What are some accomplishments you've made? And what did you learn about yourself? Um, at Landmark or in general? In general and at Landmark. Um, I, I saw ever since, I mean, especially coming to Landmark because that was a big, um, big step forward in education because most of my years uh, was, was spent kind of having to deal with my learning difference. And um, it was much more difficult to, to get things done, finish things, or feel happy with what I accomplished. Um, but then, but then coming to Landmark, I was, I was made to see every little goal, every little goal um, as progress, that getting one thing done was progress when I used to see that as a failure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm really proud of, I've kind of changed my, um, my perspective from, from seeing something as a failure to a step of the process. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I, I should have said that last question came in from, you know, from a viewer. Um, and I've got another question for John from a viewer. John, why live in a neurodivergent community? Why not just blend in at a mostly neurotypical environment? Well, I think we do, um, of necessity, have to blend in in a um, mostly neurotypical environment. I, I think that um, for the time a student lives at Landmark, they're immersed in a neurodivergent community. But, um, but I think that uh, you could think of that as, um, as time on a kibitz or time, as, you know, as a missionary, if you went to a religious school. And, and I think that people who do those kinds of things, they think those were really important events that shaped their lives. They learned uh, values and ideas and goals. And, um, and I think that being among neurodivergent people in such concentration. Um, and we're all like geeks and weirdos and freaks, you know, and we do all these different things. And, and who uh, better to open your eyes to the weirdness and opportunity of the world than a bunch of weirdos, you know, we're, we're the best for that. And, um, and I think that people are gonna come away from here and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna be interested on the one hand uh, in things like being being these quants that solve the puzzles of making Wall Street run or being computer scientists or being veterinarians, but they're also going to come away from here with a lifelong connection to, to Nerf and to, you know, Elder Scrolls and, you know, and, and Dungeons and Dragons and, and, and Comic-Con and science fiction conventions and all the other stuff that we do. And, and I think that it's the kind of stuff you'll never forget. And, um, and this is, if you're different like us, this is, is the place that you can do it. And, and you know, I, I would just say too that the people who are watching this thing, um, they don't necessarily know that you came here as a student about a decade ago and now you're working here. And, um, and in the time, just between you coming here as a student and, and us talking about this tonight, we have seen a total change of perception from a complete focus on disability accommodation to a focus on bringing out exceptionality and, and neurodiversity. And that's like a, just a dramatic change. So if you ask, why would you want to be in that? Well, who wouldn't want to be in that? If you were different, you would want to be at the center of change. I, I mean, at least that's what I think. You know, not everyone probably wants to do it, but but I think that's got to be attractive. So that's that's my answer to that. Thank you. So what do you think about why you would want to be involved in this? I think just having a little, little bit of like more sense of pride yeah. in, in a gigantic community, really. Like that's the emphasis that it really is huge um, and and but people need to come together and advocate because uh, it's one of 
at least advocated groups. I think it's it's really true that nobody's going to stand up for us if we don't stand up for ourselves. And as special ed students, especially, we have been really uh, pushed around and marginalized in grade school and high school. And um, and I think there's strength in numbers. I, I think that students who have felt oppressed and belittled and all, they can come here and and now it's 500 strong, 600, 750 and 1,000, you know, and it's a little army <laughs> and, um, and it's, it's empowering. So, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I got a question about what students say about early orientation and do they mind coming or do they get something out of it? So, I mean, you can imagine for a lot of incoming first year students, um, the thought of ending summer, you know, <laughs> half a week early and coming to school, it, it doesn't appeal to all of them. Um, most of them are excited, but some of them have some reservations. However, um, once they get here, I, I think I think students are, are really quick to bond. Um, it's a small group, about 40 to 60 students on campus, They're kind of the only students on campus. They have the opportunity to get used to the space, get really comfortable with each other, um, and, and also get really familiar with the staff and make personal connections with the staff before the rest of the incoming first years arrive. And that bond that they form in the first few days and that comfort with each other that they form in the first few days really carries through for the rest of the year. I think that colleges who um, embrace neurodiversity are all recognizing that. <laughs> like uh, William and Mary has a thing called the Summer Bridge Program. And um, at William and Mary, the uh, students actually come to the bridge program in the middle of summer, July, they come when the college is largely empty and they are able to um, see what college is going to be like in a safe setting because it's not you know, running at that moment. And the uh, orientation here, I, I think, will probably ultimately develop in that way. It's like a it's like a soft start. Mm -hmm. If you've never uh, been in a college and you've never uh, lived in a dorm or anything, I think the chance to um, be able to experience living in a place like this and eating meals and maybe you attend a mock lecture by a professor and you listen to uh, how you get different services on campus and you don't have to worry about having to get to classes also when all that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we have to recognize that uh, we're different in many ways and stuff that um, that other people might take for granted, we can't, we don't take for granted. We don't understand those things. And, and I think that programs that make it explicit like that make it more likely that we'll succeed. And, and I think that it's it's common sense that's emerging from neurodivergent people. Absolutely. It's common sense for us. Other people might think it's not necessary, but for us, it is really important. So. We've got another question from a viewer. Um, how many students come right out of high school versus come as gap year students? Um, so the answer, we, we have a mix of both. Um, Katie, Katie shared her experience of coming, how she came to Landmark. And um, I also, I was at another college before coming to Landmark and I intended to only be here for a semester. Um, and then about halfway through my sem first semester, I realized just how much I could get out of Landmark. Um, and then literally what I would think like now thought it was just going to be like, a semester break and go back to my original college, but after seeing what Larrick has done for me in just a semester, yeah, I can feel myself here for four years or <laughs> so lucky. <laughs> but, uh, I think what you're going to see is um, I think that um, in the wider working world, 
Um, SAP originally pioneered the autism at work concept. Mm -hmm. And um, autism at work is the idea that uh, corporations can gain competitive advantage by putting autistic people to work in places that we are optimally suited mm -hmm. and have an advantage. And um, that has been embraced now by Google, Microsoft, HP Enterprise, Ernst & Young Accountants, Ford, you know, it's just countless companies that are doing that. And, um, and they now are saying, okay, you universities and colleges supply us with these people. And, um, and of course, there is not a good supply of neurodivergent people coming out of college, at least openly neurodivergent people. And, um, and I think what you're going to see happen is um, you're going to see more collaborations evolve where Landmark as like a focal point for neurodivergent people um, can prepare those people and help them find the path they want to go on, whether it's liberal arts, it's, it's science, it's math, whatever it may be. And, um, and they'll go from, from high school to here to various kinds of colleges and universities, and in some cases directly into the workforce and from there out into the workplace. And, um, and, and I think that we are just about to see that idea take off um, because this is, um, this is a piece that co other conventional colleges have been missing. What they say when I talk to them is, um, is they say neurodiversity is a great value and we want to adopt it at our school. But one thing uh, we wonder is if uh, neurodivergent people don't do well passing conventional admission exams, but they're bright and capable, how do we identify the potential students? And, and I think that an institution like this is the answer, or at least it's one answer. I mean, I think we have a big country and we need more answers than one, one landmark. But but I think that we can show the way here. And, uh, and I think it's something that everyone can be proud to be part of. So I think it's a cool thing. So Katie, we've got a question. Um, do you feel like you've helped other students who have arrived after you? Maybe not directly, because <laughs> um, I feel uh, when I see like new students having the same anxieties that I first felt and and then me giving them kind of reassurance that they're going to be okay. And I, I look at myself and I'm like, well, I was that person <laughs> um, when I first came to Landmark and um, someone gave me reassurance and now it's going down the line. It's um, so, so it wasn't, I guess that's really intentional at first. I think um, new students kind of just look up to, immediate, immediately look up to uh, people who have been here longer and who decided to be here despite uh, maybe being dragged by their parents for the first time coming um, or very hesitant and, and staying and actually like loving being here. Um, what kind of worries do a lot of new students have that you can relate to? Um, definitely socially. Um, a lot of students, uh, I mean, even going to any college, you worry socially because new environment with um, with usually no one you know. Um, but even more so with students who uh, who have like never had strong social connections and. Um, and I, I see students who are, are worried about even with like-minded people making friends. Um, but then uh, like social skills at lunch, letting them kind of have a direct spot to feel comfortable in. And, and people who were silent the first day are now like in crowds, groups of friends um, and in their confidence grows. Well, I really see the same thing. Just over the span of uh, six months, um, I have observed um, in coming here and talking to uh, 
um, student groups. Uh, the students are kind of going from what's neurodiversity and what's that about, and they're like fully on board with the idea of neurodiversity, empowerment, when is our next meeting, and what are we going to do next? And they're like, there is a, just a, a real enthusiasm, and it just took off. So oh yeah, it, it's really, it's really. I mean, they were ready to rock and roll. They just needed, you know, to, a catalyst to start it. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's really cool. Great. And John, the next question I'm getting is for you. Um, it's about neurodiversity at work. The initiatives, how corporations are recognizing the strengths of neurodivergent individuals. Can I ask it how they do that? Yes. Okay. Well. Um, you can, um, you can actually uh, Google autism at work, that phrase, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that you'll, um, autism at work, they've had uh, annual conferences for several years, and um, you can read uh, the programs and the notes and stuff from the conferences. You can read the uh, mission statements of the companies, um, but the, the gist of it is that the, uh, Companies are all pledging to try and make 1% of their workforce autistic, and they cannot find enough people to do that in every case, so that's proving to be a challenge. Um, and um, they are um, talking about the places that we can excel, like uh, some of us are really skilled at, um, at patterns and matrices, and there are we may have skills in, uh, in scheduling or in software. Um, it's interesting, a lot of us have real challenges in executive function, organizing our own lives from day to day, but we might be exceptionally talented developing scheduling systems to handle shipping containers, you know? And we can't control our own lives, but we can control cargo flow. And, um, and so um, there are, I, I think the companies are just looking at where our logical systematizing brains can um, can provide an advantage. And uh, there are uh, academic papers emerging on it. Uh, last spring, there was a uh, paper on neurodiversity in the workforce in the Harvard Business Review. Um, and uh, I, I see more and more about that all the time. Another thing that's interesting is um, most of the companies in autism at work have announced this year that they are letting go of the requirement for a college degree to hire technical and management people. So in principle, somebody who comes to Landmark, for example, who um, fixated on computer science and he wants to do that maybe he doesn't have real good social skills but perhaps at landmark he learns social skills or she learns them and they study computer science on their own and they're really really smart at it but they don't necessarily do all the courses to graduate um those companies are saying hey there's a path for that bright person to spend a few years at landmark and show what they can do and just come work for us we don't necessarily require that degree. And, and so there again, we have a, a means of making a path for people who are different to succeed in the world. And, and I think that's uh, it's kind of an existential question many colleges are going to face. Um, how will they alter the content of teaching and the, and the methods of learning in a world where the degree is not so much the necessary goal of college as the knowledge itself. Thank you, John. Um, our next question is actually about um, the peer social skills groups. Um, John, I, I know you're you're actually familiar with the book, um, The Art of Making Friends. Yep. You, wrote, you wrote the foreword for it, and it's, it's really um, kind of different the peers curriculum just in a different format. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about the peers curriculum? Um, I would say that um, a little over um, 
10 years ago, our government made a decision that um, in formulating public health policy, the groups who were affected by that policy should have a strong voice in the plans that were made. Um, so most obviously, for example, recovering alcoholics were invited to take part in, in looking at how we deal with alcohol addiction in this country. People who were living with cancer um, suddenly had a voice in, in cancer research. Um, people uh, who live with depression have a voice in, in depression. And at that time, um, we were really beginning to spend a lot of money on autism research. Autism at that time was viewed as a terrible childhood disease and an epidemic. And um, when autistic adults like me were invited to offer um, our opinions and our advice in the planning of autism research, I think that really changed the face of it because uh, all of a sudden, instead of a world where people said, well, show me the autistic adults, there aren't any autistic adults. This is this horrible childhood uh, disability. And, and you now you see articulate, successful middle-aged people who grew up with autism. Um, I think that we've had a significant influence on that. Um, so to uh, get to what that has to do with peers, um, I was invited to um, take part in, um, in formulating the questions that our public health agencies would ask autism researchers to solve. Mm -hmm. And instead of, um, instead of the very low level genetic research that the government was focused on at that time, I and other autistic people said, some of that research may do great things for us, but if it does great things, it'll help our grandchildren, not us. And we have real pressing problems that we need help with right now. For example, um, autistic people um, are known to have communication disability. And those just sound like dry words in a textbook, but in real life, it means we don't know what to say in a job interview. We want to have a relationship. We want to have girlfriends, boyfriends. We, we want to be, you know, to be able to marry and and to and to live as family. And and in order to do that, we have to be able to make connections. And and so that is a disability that's life threatening to us. And um, and I'm really proud that. Our public health agencies took that up and they encouraged researchers to research that. Um, Liz Logason, um, a psychology professor at UCLA, um, had an idea for a structured way of helping autistic people make friends and work together in groups. And, and ultimately that became the thing called peers. And, um, and I'm certainly not a, a creator of peers. Um, Dr. Logason and her team of researchers are entirely responsible for its creation. But, but certainly what I'm proud of is being an autistic person who stood up in front of our government and said that that is the kind of research we need to be supporting and doing. That's what will actually help autistic people right now. And so having done that research, the next step is to see colleges like this, um, high schools uh, like Ivy Mount, Rockville, Maryland, you know, teaches uh, with a peers curriculum. And then they also use the unstuck curriculum, which is another revolutionary thing for helping with executive function. Um, so to see that kind of stuff taking off, it's a really cool thing. And, and it all came from our government's decision to involve autistic people 
in the shaping of public health policy that affects us. Thank you. Um, and, and next question, is there an association, an association website that would help find neurodiversity schools or programs in the mid-Atlantic? Um, yes, the College Autism Network is one organization who keeps this information. Um, they can be found online. And John, do you know of others? No, I, I don't. Um, I think that um, it kind of uh, begs to be created. Uh, there are resources for autism at college that you can find through the Autistic Self-Advocacy Networks, uh, referred to as ASAM. Mm -hmm. um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network is the major autism advocacy organization in America that is entirely led and, and created by autistic people. Um, so I think ASAN tends to be, you know, out front with uh, what we want and what we need as a as a people, and um, I think that and the college network you mentioned are where I would look, and, and we have to hope that both more resources to find the colleges appear, but also more colleges have to embrace this, and, and I think that. The more people do embrace it, and the more this begins to look like a civil rights issue of our decade, um, I think you're going to going to see more. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from a viewer: Does Landmark require SATs or other standardized tests? No, we do not require SATs. They're optional but not necessary for admission. Landmark does require diagnostic information from incoming students. Thank you for that. That's an interesting thing, um, you know, that uh, at one time um, you had to, uh, to be Catholic, be Jewish, be Anglican, to go to a religious college. And of course, those were the only kinds of specialized colleges that existed. Um, and uh, to enter Landmark, you have to pass a similar test. You have to be <laughs> autistic or dyslexic or whatever. And, and you know what may happen is um, we may create a situation where 20 years from now, Landmark is full of exciting freaks and geeks, and they're known to have come to school here and gone out in the world and created music or created software or created, you know, other unique things. And, and the more Landmark's alumni become known for doing cool things, um, the Landmark of 2050 or 60 may find itself confronting non-neurodivergent people that want to enter. And, and what will probably happen is Landmark will let in anyone, but it'll still be at its core a neurodivergent school, just as you don't have to be Catholic to go to Holy Cross now. <laughs> and um, I suspect that that's, that's a path that, uh, that any successful neurodivergent school will follow. Because I don't think that there's a desire on Landmark's part to exclude people, but there is uh, absolutely a desire to make a place that's a uh, a safe home for you know for us. Well, I think now you go to a school like Notre Dame or Holy Cross, and there's no doubt that you found a safe home if you're a Catholic, and there's no need to say it's Catholics only. But um, but I think uh, here, I think it's just starting, and and it'll move on to the next phase, next generation. <laughs> that would be my guess. I mean, I certainly, I'm not the leader of it, but if I were to predict what would what would happen, that's what I would predict. Thank you. So. Okay, I've got a question for Katie. Um, how do Landmark's professors help you through your learning difficulties? Um, kind of like before, since a lot of the uh, faculty are neurodivergent, it's a lot easier to relate or express um, a specific difficulty it, um, I don't have to 
explain as much um, to, to professors, um, usually like bare minimum of what I need help with, and they'll be like, oh yeah, I know that. And um, it's, it's a lot more comforting than, than feeling like I have to describe my life story to like another teacher professor who hasn't experienced anything like that before. Um, it gets exhausting. Isn't it also true, though, that the fact that they're all familiar with our life stories is, you know, that's just sort of a comfort, too, isn't it? Yeah, you you actually have, um, you really know your professors here. It's not um, like they'll always know your face, know your name, um, and vice versa. Uh, you really get a one-on-one um, -on -one relationship because of, uh, shared stories and and them knowing your story, and and they really help me see, uh, even me just to um, see them as people to work with and not like not that kind of hierarchy of professor and student. It's yeah, really it's a closer thing there, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. We've got a question from a viewer. Um, I have dyspraxia. What note-taking options are, th are there for me? The answer, we help connect students with technology to support note-taking. Some students audio record classes, others rely on notes posted from faculty. Students also use speech-to-text software to support writing. We endeavor to find a way for all students to get what they need from class. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, and a question for John, are there websites to help students with autism figure out what their unique talents are and how could that lead to a vocation or profession? Um, I'm not sure how you could learn what your unique talents are from a website. I think that, um, There are some things that you try doing it and you really like it and all of a sudden it takes over your life and it's really transformative. But reading about doing it, you would have said, that sucks, that sounds stupid, I don't wanna go there. And, um, and I think that um, when I look at uh, my own life and how my first career was in engineering sounds in, in music and electronics. Um, I couldn't have done that if my parents hadn't been a faculty a few miles south of here at the University of Massachusetts. And um, because I was an inquisitive kid and I was interested in electronics, my parents, my mother brought me um, to the lab of one of her friends who was an engineering professor and he turned me over to the grad students and um and the grad students were like you know so smart and resourceful and they like knew everything and um and the resources of the university anything I could imagine was there to experiment. And there were books in the library and test equipment, and things I could build. And um, I think that for a young person coming to college today, there's the potential for that same experience. Anything that you're curious about and, and how can you know what a young boy or girl will be curious about um, but a college provides you the chance to see those things and experience them. And, and you, can, you can go on the community. You can see what it would be like to be a veterinarian. You can go on a work-study thing and see what it's like to work in a pizza place. And you can see what it's like to be uh, designing virtual reality right next door to us here. You can see what it's like being a student of history, digging into things in the library that you can't necessarily find on Google at home. And um, I think that 
a college can provide those kinds of opportunities, and I don't think you can see them on a website. I think you you have to experience it in real life. You know, maybe you don't even want to do any of this stuff. Maybe you want to be a race car driver or something, and you may not even want to go to college, but you might learn about it in a place like this. Thank you. Um, another question for you, John. The question is, are people with nonverbal LD on the autism spectrum? Um, the, um, it's probably uncertain. A person who is nonverbal um, might be nonverbal because they have some um, vocal cord impairment or a, a problem with control of that. They might, uh, autistic people are said to have communication disabilities. So some autistic people can't read body language. Some autistic people don't understand words said to them. Some autistic people don't understand either. Mm -hmm. um, other autistic people understand the words, but cannot utter the answers. Of the autistic people who have challenges uttering the answers, some autistic people have difficulty formulating the answer in their mind. Others can formulate the answer, but they can't say it, so they can type it immediately on a keyboard. Others um, have even a jumbling, and they couldn't type it on a keyboard. Uh, yet another group of people, uh, also on the autism spectrum, has processing delay. And uh, they might hear your question, and two minutes later, when you've moved on in your mind, they answer you back, like you just said it two seconds ago. And um, yeah, those are all examples of communication disability. All of those people could be on the autism spectrum, and those are very different things, as you can imagine. So in a high school, probably half those things could be called a nonverbal learning disability. Um, when they, um, in the previous definition of the autism spectrum, we had PDD and OS, we had Asperger syndrome, we had autism, and each of them was associated with a package of services. Now schools have to deal with ASD, and it's all under one umbrella, and it's made it more difficult because it's not as easy to divide the services up. So schools are returning to these things like nonverbal learning disability, and but there's not really a good answer to that. We can't be certain that nonverbal learning disability in Massachusetts is the same as it is in North Dakota. That's, that's really a fundamental problem with that. Thank you. I, a question for me, um, how do prospective students get a current diagnosis and testing required for admissions? So the testing landmark requires is a psychoeducational evaluation. You can check in with a physician or school in your local area. They will have local referral information and a good idea of what's available in your area. Thank you for that question. All right. I have so we, a question here, but that's not. Oh, oh. So. I, we actually we've got one last question for Katie. What advice would you give neurodivergent students thinking about college? Um, something differently, which I have told myself when I was in that same position, um, especially after receiving uh, receiving a diagnosis and. Um, and kind of being discouraged that I would ever have success at any college um, was to not hold yourself to that diagnosis, for lack of better wording. Because um, when I got my diagnosis um, with nonverbal learning disorder, I, I got into the habit of, 
of avoiding things because I told myself I can't do that because of my disability and or I won't be able to try this because I know I'll fail because of my learning disability. Um, and, and that's a really inhibiting thought process. Um, it, um, it's a lot more uplifting to, uh, to, to not have more like hold yourself to, to all these, um, kind of criteria of your diagnosis that, that all these goals you have for the future are now crushed because of a diagnosis mm -hmm. and in college is a great example of, of finding your strengths and then um, or your interests that you can go into because it's experiencing um, through doing. No one can tell you what your strengths are. You find them out. And, um, and I think college for a lot of uh, both neurotypical and neurodivergent students is um, helps you find strengths. That's really, you know, an example of how um, how these diagnostic labels really are sort of a double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, it's really empowering if you learn that you are autistic, and or if you learn you have any other diagnostic label, and you read that these are the traits associated with that label, and you think to yourself, well, I can... I can adjust how I approach the world in a view of that. And, um, and I think that you can change your life for the better, informed by that knowledge. But the other side of that is, like you said, there is a very real risk that people will say, oh, well, she's got this nonverbal learning disability. She's never going to amount to anything. We, we're not going to put her in an advanced placement class. We're not going to put her in anything where we'll have a high expectation. And, um, and we are often uh, set up to uh, fail. And, um, and I also think that in many cases, the uh, labels are misleading. I, I wouldn't doubt for a moment that she would uh, meet the diagnostic criteria for the nonverbal learning disability diagnosis that she's got. But at the same time, she clearly is not nonverbal <laughs> sitting here talking to us. And, and so, um, and, and, and I think the same is true for me. People think they have some idea of what autism is, and, um, and they would look at me and they would say, well, you don't look autistic. Well, she doesn't look nonverbal learning disabled. <laughs> and, and, and I think a final point with that is, um, is they don't even call it disability. They call it nonverbal learning disorder. They call it autism spectrum disorder, and I don't think either of us want to go through life having people think of us as disorders. You don't want that, do you? No. No, and so, you know, <laughs> and, and so that's a, that's a part of it that probably none of us care for. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there's no mistaking, though, that learning how being different affects us can change our life for the good. And I think we have to focus on, on that. And I think Landmark's role is bringing that out after, for many of us, going through an elementary and high school career that focused on what we can't do. Gosh, well, thank you so much, John. And thank you, Katie. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in to if learn we, more about have, us. If we had like a pot, we could pass it through the TV and they could put in money. <laughs> all the questions from viewers and um if you want to find out more about our programs please reach out and talk with us have a good night yeah. <laughs>